Welcome to the Grow Strong Leaders podcast. I'm your host, Meredith Bell, and I interview business leaders who are committed to their own growth and the development of everyone on their team. If you enjoy my podcast, be sure to subscribe and rate it on your favorite podcast platform. Thank you for joining me today. I'm your host, Meredith Bell. And you know, if you've been listening to my show, that I love to bring you leaders who are focused on their own growth and development and also committed to the growth and development of the people who are on their team or in their world. And today I have someone very special who has been doing both of those things for a long time. And I am just so excited to welcome as my guest today, Jamie J. Jamie, welcome to my show. Hi, Meredith. Thank you so much. Well, before we get started, you know, I want to give a big shout out to our mutual good friend and colleague, um, David Schreiner Khan, because he's the one who brought you into my world. And I'm very grateful to him that he did that. Because when I was describing to him my ideal guest, he said, oh, I've got the perfect person for you. (laughs) And he was absolutely right. So, Jamie, it's it's just really going to be a great conversation. I know. Yeah, they, and and thanks to, to David, he's he's absolutely amazing, and I'm so glad he was able to connect us. Uh, just like you, I I just uh, I'm really blessed to have him in uh, my life and in our lives. I think it's uh, it, it makes me a better person for having him in my life. That's great. Well, before we jump into our conversation, let me tell my listeners a little bit about you. Jamie is the founder and managing director of Bottleneck Distant Assistance. And since 2006, his company has been sourcing business distant assistance from the Philippines. They support entrepreneurs, solopreneurs, C-suite executives, founders, and other professionals who are doing the wrong things and creating their own bottlenecks in order that they can focus best on their own best work. Jamie is also a U.S. Army veteran. And so, Jamie, I want to thank you for your service to our country. And he's the author of a book called Quit Repeating Yourself. His life, in my opinion, has been quite an adventure, and I know that you're going to be inspired by the values that he's built into his company and that he and his team live by every day. So, Jamie, let's start with this interesting story you have where you were homeless three different times, and now you have built this very successful multi-million dollar business. I know there there are a lot of parts to that story, but give us the short version so people can appreciate who you are and where you've come from. Yes, I like it. Uh, My good friend, Christopher Lockhead, who was one of the authors in the book, Play Bigger, he said, uh, Jamie, you never make a long story shorter. You always make a long story longer. So in living (laughs) up to his expectations, um, yes, this is a long story, a little bit longer, uh, but I will remain as brief as possible in that it's been crazy. I was homeless when I was a kid twice um, through some um, challenges that my uh, dad, who adopted me, um, went through in his business. And as a result of those particular challenges uh, coming to fruition, uh, it resulted in us becoming homeless, where we literally stayed in a 1979 brown um, uh, Chevy Suburban. Uh, my little brother, me, uh, my dad, my mom and two poodles, two toy poodles, um, mm-hmm. along with our luggage. And so that was kind of, um, that was a, that was a challenging time, as you can imagine, very, very impressionable teenagers and, and, and having to go through that experience. Um, and then it happened again, older. And this time it was my responsibility, my own, um, fault. And, uh, I think part of the reason while I'm so humble and, um, appreciative um, and not taking things for granted is the fact that for me, that was my bottom point. I know how bad things can get and I'm motivated not to repeat myself, Mm -hmm. right? Uh, Again, in doing that. Um, But at the same time, 
it's part of who I am and I don't want to forget about it. I want to embrace it. And I want to appreciate the fact that the choices that I made were wrong and don't do that again. And, and uh, you know, it's, there's something about begging outside of a fast food restaurant um, for a dollar so you could get something to eat um, that is a very humbling experience. And for me to carry that with me um, today, no matter who I'm speaking with or who I'm talking to or what kind of business we're doing, I always appreciate that while may, other people may not have been homeless like I have, the likelihood or the chances that they've experienced something as emotionally um, challenging mm. um, are eerily similar. Now, just because they weren't homeless doesn't mean that they didn't experience the same type of pain in a different way, but now we're kind of able to uh, relate with one another and everybody goes through challenges. And that's what's kind of really cool is everybody has their own unique experiences and to be able to um, resonate with uh, the fact that other people are going to go and experience challenges um, perhaps in the same way or, or something just as meaningful. Um, that's what makes human beings awesome and, and working together. So that was my long story longer. <laughs> well, I'm curious, was there a specific individual or a specific turning point that caused you to be able to make that shift that was necessary to, I guess, rebuild your confidence from, you know, there's a loss of, of so much when you have that situation where you are homeless and you can't just, I don't think, just, you know, will yourself to pull yourself up from, you know, by the bootstraps, but maybe that's what happened with you. Tell us what was there a turning point that caused you to get on a path that's led to the success you have today? Um, yes, there's one person in particular, a good friend of mine for 20 plus years. Uh, he, along with his wife and their two kids, by the way, um, and their dog, uh, they were kind enough to take me, take me in when I needed, needed help. And it's kind of funny when you're doing well, there's so many people around that want to be part of those times, that organization, that social, whatever circle. And then all of a sudden, when there's not those social benefits, um, it's really interesting what happens with the relationships and the dynamics within those relationships of, you know, whom you thought or considered to be friends. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot changes. Um, and the true colors pop out. And what's amazing is I can count on my hand the amount of people that I could literally go to with nothing, uh, with the exception of the shirt on my back, um, that would take me in and care for me. Um, and that, in my opinion, is a good thing. I think that's okay because it's hard to maintain that many relationships mm -hmm. so closely. Mm -hmm. So I choose to pour myself into those relationships. And, and in this case, it was in, uh, man, it was 2009 or something like that. Right after the um, housing crisis, um, I like, kind of lost everything. And my poor decisions um, caused me to be in a place that I was. And I kind of went into a little downward spiral and my good friend, Rob Robbins, man, oh man, um, who happens to be a very successful attorney, um, his wife, Dawn, their two kids and their, their dog at the time, whose name was Baskin, Baskin Robbins, um, uh, you know, they, they took me into their home, uh, they fed me, um, you know, I, I borrowed his bike to bike around to job interviews, uh, I took, the, I tried to do all that and nobody was hiring at the time and uh, I had to figure my stuff out. And they kept, they, they took care of me. And still today, I just talked to them yesterday. Like he's probably uh, my best friend in the entire world. Um, and, I, and I'm just fortunate to have, you know, probably a half a dozen really close people that I could count on. And I think that's probably the turning point is they pushed me. They didn't push me too hard. I was also very close to um, considering suicide at the time. And boy, he decided to 
walk away from his job that day. And he just sat down with me in his garage and just asked me questions and kind of walked me through it. They pressured me, but they didn't pressure me. Does that make sense? Absolutely. You know, to me, Jamie, as I'm listening to you describe that friendship and what um, that family did for you, it reminds me of how each one of us can be a support system for other people. And it doesn't have to be this huge number. Um, You know, if we can each have one or two people, like you said, a small number that we can count on, who can also count on us to be there for them, you know, I think as personal leadership in our lives, whether at work, home, or with friends, that's such an important quality. And some of that is going to carry over, I think, into what I want to talk to you about today. One of the things that my listeners may be curious about, you refer to virtual, I'm sorry, distant assistance instead of virtual assistance. What's the distinction you make between those two words? Yeah, this is a, this is a very good question. Um, and let me first um, preface this by saying um, a lot of this has to do with category design. And if you're not familiar with category design, I highly recommend you go out and read that book, Play Bigger, because it really challenges the way that you think about creating a business in a way that's different, not better, but different. Mm. And, and this, is re- this is the very first thing you really have to think about. Um, one of the worst things, and I'll give you a quick example of category design and what not to do. But if you remember the old Pepsi commercials, they would say, we're not Coke, we're better. This is one of the worst ways <laughs> that you can take your category because right now, what are you thinking about? You're thinking about Coke. You're mm-hmm. thinking about Coke, not Pepsi. And that was a commercial that Pepsi paid for. Um, so in, in staying with category design, I wanted to think of a way not to make our thing better, than anybody else, but to differentiate us from everyone else. And I I use the term competitors loosely because I don't want to get in competition with other people. Mm -hmm. Sure, we interact with each other. They do something great and fantastic. And wow, that's something really neat. And it's working. People resonate with that in the same way. Hopefully they look at some of the things that we're doing. So while I use that term loosely competition or competitor, um, I, I often liken it to a category. So within this category, there's certain different companies mm-hmm. that consider themselves to be a virtual assistant company. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. The distant assistant is not better. It is just different. I really want to hammer that home. In my opinion, a virtual assistant could be AI. It could be chatbot. It could be a human being but that human being is more transactional based in nature. Now, is this a good thing? Of course, if you wanna get a project done, you go to Upwork, you go to, you know, Fiverr, you go to, if you know, something like that, chances are what's gonna happen is you're gonna request to have something done that either you don't have time to do or that you don't like doing. Um, It just drains you of energy, but you need that certain thing done. So you reach out to somebody who is an expert at it. The challenge is when you delegate that particular task, most likely a lot of information needs to be exchanged through several iterations. Hopefully you come to a project ending with you being happy saying, okay, finally. And then you give money for that in exchange. Mm -hmm. Transactional based in nature. The difference for the distant assistant, which is not always the right thing for you, but the difference is it's more intimate based in design, actually. Our candidates are really interested in focusing on who you are. What is your vision? What is your mission? Do they align with that vision and mission? What, what's your tone? What is your voice? Um, this is a big difference because now it's more intimate based in nature. Mm-hmm. And if you've ever worked with someone and you said, oh, that person just gets me, that's the distant assistant. And it's a human being that gets you, they believe in this stuff. And uh, by extension, uh, I always say, usually at the end of my calls, bye for now, because I hope to speak with you again. It's just something oh, that I've always done. I like that. And if you look at our team, 
When they end a call now, they say bye for now. They pay attention to the voice and the tone and we all align that way. And we're all intimately involved with one another professionally, right? Professionally, but it's that whole thing. This is a distant assistant. And the way we came up with this category was right on the tails of this whole pandemic. And one of those words that came out that wasn't recognized before was a thing called social distancing. Everybody was social distancing. So we took distant assistance and we made that into our new category. Mm. And it's a real live human being with an intimate based relationship in a distant area, distant location. And so that's the the uh, story of how we differentiate distant assistant versus virtual. You know, there are so many takeaways just from that for my listeners to consider whether they own a business or they're working inside of an organization and they've got a team. What is it, you know, ask yourself, what is it you want to be known for or known as? And so what words or word can you use to really um capture that. I love the process matter. you went through. Hmm. You just nailed it. Oh my gosh, Mary, I'm so sorry to cut you off. And I, I really need to practice this. <laughs> One of my words of the year was listen, listen intently and soulfully to engage nobly. And here I am just spewing out, but I wanted to, to interrupt real quick, if that's okay. I know this is your sure. show, I'm so sorry, but Meredith, you just nailed it. Cause you said, what words can you think of the words? That's everything. The words are words matter. And if you can take a word and define it in, in a new and different manner or a group of words together, um, that's category design. That's what people can latch on to. Now be prepared because it's going to be a long road because people don't know this. It's, it's not a recognizable thing. Mm -hmm. But that's how you break through and become a category leader or a category king or queen. Well, let's build on that because one of the things I loved in our first conversation was learning about how you choose one word for the year and really focus on that. And I would love for you to share what is your word for 2022 and talk about some of the things you've done to bring that word to life with every single person in your company. Yeah. So, you know what, what I, what I really like about um, word of the years and studying the words of years and, and um, um, is, is it, it's something that's very intentional. It's something that um, you do and you study this for an entire year. They say you build a habit in what, 27 days or something like that. If you do something consistently, well, I've tried it before and, and, and yeah, you can kind of build a habit, but you don't necessarily really study um, that, that particular word. And I think it has a lot to do with mindset. So ever since I believe it was 2018, I've studied a word every single year and in the in the words that I've studied every single year, um, it's really helped me kind of dive into the true meaning of that and how can I participate and really be intentional about, in this case, curiosity. Uh, curiosity is our word of 2022. Now, if you look back at 2018, my word of the year, I believe that was my first word of the year was 2018. And that's focus, finding opportunities by creating uninterrupted strategy sessions. In 2019, uh, the word of the year was uh, listen, because I really wanted to practice listening, listen intently and soulfully to engage notably. In 2020, <laughs> the, it, it, the word of the year was implement. And this was, this, was, um, this was kind of a fun and exciting time, but uh, implement is impacting mindful professionals through leadership, equality, motivation, and education to nurture thoughtfulness. And I thought that was really neat. And we break these down in 2021, my word of the year was kindness. And that one really resonated with me because uh, we like to lead with kindness here. And kindness stands for kindness, uh, illuminates natural decency by creating neoteric energy through selfless statements. And that kind of led to curiosity, our new word of the year. And our word of the year is something that we will focus on literally 
all year long. And curiosity is um, curiosity unlocks reluctance by investigating opportunities to stimulate intelligent thoughts just for you. What's neat about that is Albert Einstein says the important thing is not to stop questioning, never lose a holy curiosity. Um, and when you start defining each letter of these words, it allows your brain to really dive into what that means, what curiosity means to me, what it means to our team. And hopefully others can maybe learn from this and be more curious, invite curiosity into your world and see how that changes. And if we can study that word underlying theme for the entire year is curiosity so that everything we build, everything that we do, we have a level of curiosity that makes us inquisitive. It keeps us digging to find better services and better resources so that our clients can be impacted in, in such a magical way um, to make their life even better. And it's through our investigative curiosity um, that we're able to find even other more ideas, more concepts that will, that will challenge us to continue to provide better services. You know, that's such a great word because to me, thinking about, you know, what your team provides, the idea of asking more questions to learn more. I mean, to me, questions are a key part of being curious because you hear something and that stimulates you to ask another question to go deeper or wider or, you know, learn more. So is that one of the ways that your team is implementing this word with either prospective clients or existing clients that you have? Absolutely. That, that's exactly. Um, the, remember I told you that the difference between the distant and the virtual is intimacy versus transactional. The more intimate you can be, meaning learning more on a deeper level, getting more curious. And what's nice is when, when I define this word, right, curiosity, Curiosity unlocks reluctance by investigating opportunities to stimulate intelligent thoughts just for you. Every single letter, we even have this on our website, um, bottleneck.online slash word of the year dash curiosity. But if you click on the letter, we define C as curiosity, a strong desire to know or learn something. And then U unlocks when you talk about the second uh, meaning in, in the letter, unlock to open something, especially a door that is locked, right? R, reluctance, feeling or showing doubt about doing something, not willing or eager to do something. Well, what can we do to address those? Each thing, individual. So our, when I say we study a word of the year, we literally study every single letter in that word, and it makes us kinder. It makes us more curious. It, it mm -hmm. helps us to listen more on a deeper level. And boy, oh boy, can we see the difference when we talk to clients with this in mind and we're more intimate, we're more engaged, we're more intentional in those conversations because of a deeper foundational understanding, not only from me, but from, it could be our developer. It could be in the way that they talk with our graphic design team. It could be in a way that one of our external distant assistants is talking to our HR. We all understand this on a much deeper level. And that's what we love about studying these words of the year. That's so great. Well, you know, thinking about uh, the ripple effect of studying a word like that, one of the other things that amazes me with your business is I believe you said you had a remarkable 3% turnover rate. Is yeah, that... it was just under five. I think it was like 4.1 4 or something. Okay, yeah. still low single digits. Yes. And so a lot of that has to do with hiring the right person. So Absolutely. I was just thinking about the curiosity that comes to bear when you're speaking to somebody and you're really listening for what would make them the right fit? There are so many companies dealing with the great resignation, you know, competing, if you will, for talent. Talk about what kind of a system have you put in place in terms of interviewing, in terms of questions that you ask that allow you to have such a low turnover? So first and foremost, yes, we want with the experience or expertise Right, that's amazing. 
But you can go out and find all the experience or expertise in the world. And if there's not a good fit for that personality within that organization, the likelihood of the overturn or the turnover happening is greatly enhanced. Um, uh, whether or not you feel how you feel towards Elon Musk, um, you know, he has a lot of people with Harvard degrees that are working for him, but he's experiencing a lot of turnover. These are the most amazing minds in the world, but they don't align with his belief, his, his core values. So you see that turnover, right? And a lot of people will fight to stay in those positions, but the number one reason why somebody leaves an organization, do you know what that is? Usually their direct manager. 100%. The manager is why they decide to leave. Why in the world would you want to work with somebody who you don't get along with? Now, they may not have all the expertise needed for a particular role with those responsibilities, but boy, if they align with the core values, this is one of the main reasons uh, that, we, that we, do, we do two things here. Number one, we ask a question. What do you want to do after you leave bottleneck? And number two is every January, everybody redefines their role and responsibilities within that role. Everybody does because they may learn things and they say, wow, I'm really good at this and I really enjoy doing this and I want to learn more. Mm -hmm. And if you notice when you're learning something, whether it's playing the guitar or doing something like that, you'll either learn a lot playing guitar or you'll kind of just mess around with it every once in a while. Why? You don't truly want to do that. You don't truly have a deep desire to either learn how to play that guitar or you do. But you might say, wow, I really like playing the harmonica. Or you might say, you know what? I would really go rather go riding my bike than playing the guitar. And I ride my bike all the time. Why? Because that's something you enjoy. And the more you do something, the better you become at it. So those are, those are the two things. The, the, the two things we look for after we ask the question, what do you want to do after you leave bottleneck? We always get the, I really want to work at bottleneck. No, no, no. What do you really want to do in your life? And that's going to give me an answer. Two things. Number one, it lets them know what kind of organization we have here. It lets them know that you can be vulnerable. You can share things that may not be to the, to the betterment of the organization. Someone may say, well, I want to be a rock and roll band. Or, you know, I want to build a rocket ship or I want to go to Juilliard. Good. Is that something we can help you with directly? No, but we'll be the first person there. If this is a stepping stone for you, now we know what to expect in this organization. You're not going to go to Juilliard next year, but maybe you want to get in in four or five years and we can be that stepping stone. Maybe we can help teach you some life lessons, but I'll be the first person if you commit to me to write that letter of recommendation or Maybe there's something in our organization where we can define a role that aligns with what they really want to do. Mm -hmm. And if that's the case, people are like, wait, you'll create this role? Wait, I can change my role? What? Of course, because I never want to have someone here working and say, oh my gosh, I don't want to go into work today. Right? I just, I don't want that. And if you can get excited, about working and having fun doing what it is that you do and you're passionate about that, wow, look at the productivity levels that will increase and look at the team that you're going to be around. Now, there's always cloudy days. We get that. That's part of life. But I, claim, I, I blame the 75-25 rule. 25% I do things here that drain me of energy. I don't like doing them. I just don't. I just don't like, I don't like making videos. I hate it, but I understand that they're important. But I do know that I'm going to be rewarded by 75% of the time where I really love doing stuff here at Bottleneck. I love talking with you. I love sharing our story. I love learning new ways of networking or new thing. I, I love thriving on you know, ways we can grow the business and scale the business. So I know that if I can get through the muck, I'm going to be rewarded by the nice beach on the other side. Mm -hmm. It is interesting. And I can't remember now the study and the results, but it isn't a huge amount of time that people have to want to be able to spend doing their favorite thing. You were mentioning 75, 25. It can be far less than that. But I think the key is that they understand they're going to be given the opportunity 
to pursue those things. And I really admire your focus on looking at roles and responsibilities as opposed to a rigid job description. And that whole mentality of, well, it's not my job description, so I don't need to do it. Getting people to think in an expansive way is is so powerful. And one of the other things that you do so beautifully, and I would love for you to, to talk about this, some people are, you know, when they've become their own bottleneck, oftentimes it's because they have trouble letting go of decision-making, you know, being willing to delegate. And you have a process for helping people learn to be good decision-makers. I would love for you to share that because I think there's so many takeaways from your process that apply to every person that's listening to my show. Yeah, Thank you for asking this question, because I think making a decision and delegation come are, are pretty cl- closely related. Um, and, and, and sometimes, kind of more often than not, believe it or not, we don't know how to comfortably make a decision and or to delegate certain tasks that we identify as things that are... Uh, kind of wrong for what we should be doing. Mm-hmm. We need to focus on things that we know when we're doing our best work. That's what we need to focus on. We need to delegate the rest, but you have to start somewhere. And how do you make a decision? Um, based on your question, what we do is we have a hierarchy here at Bottleneck. So there is an organizational structure, but decisions are made linear. It doesn't matter whether you're a web developer or a VP or director of operations, or payroll, doesn't matter. If you make a decision and you have the power to make a decision because we all embrace the power of making mistakes and how good failure is, as long as you don't repeat yourself all the time. But when you go into making a decision, feel comfortable with making that decision. Feel comfortable with coming up with an idea. Feel comfortable with executing against that idea enough so that it will support any argument that you have to have an idea come into fruition. Do you understand what I mean by that? Okay, I just wanna be clear on that because when you make a decision at bottleneck, whoever you are, you make a decision with three things. Number one, is it good for the company? Number two, is it good for the team internally? And then and only then, is it good for the client? If the company is not structurally sound financially, and culturally, it is going to be extremely difficult to delegate and communicate effectively to the internal team because they're worried about something else, something culturally. They're maybe no, they're not getting a paycheck on time, something like that. They're, they're wondering where this money's coming from. If their brain is occupied with worrisome thoughts like that, how in the world can I expect them to take, or can anybody else expect them to take care of our clients? And then that's just going to blow our clients up. So anybody that makes a decision has to make sure, okay, if I make this decision, is it good for the company? Is it good for the team? And then is it good for the clients? And usually what you find is they're curious enough about figuring this out. They'll identify some maybe friction points in that decision-making process. Ultimately, the best way to find out is that if, it, if you fall flat on your face, that was probably a poor uh, decision. How can I improve upon that? And we can't learn unless we make failures. And if we're too afraid to do something that might go against the grain, Mm -hmm. we're, what kind of company is that? What kind of life is that to live in? So, uh, that's, that's our theory behind decision-making processes. And, and once you do make that decision and you go through it, it's much easier to move with both feet as far as delegating tasks to somebody else that really excels at doing that. Mm -hmm. So do you have a process for um, approving what someone wants to do or do they just have enough free reign once they've answered those three questions to just go for it and see what happens? They have enough free reign to go for it and see what happens to a certain limit, if it has to do with if there's a if there's a financial um, requirement on our end, there's an approval process. But if this is a decision um, to 
change a, a workflow or to change a process or to um, come up with a new uh, product. Um, this is on them. I want them to have, just go for it. Uh, I got a question from my director of operations the other day saying, Jamie, I have this idea. Can I do this? I said, just do it. <laughs> I don't want to hear just, just do, if you feel, I trust them so much, everybody in the organization, they want to see bottleneck succeed. They want, so, so, and he, he, here's what it is. And this gets me so excited. We just had a client that we talked to who was having, you know, a challenging time because they didn't even want to go away for a conference because they knew when they came back, they were going to be playing catch up for the next two weeks. They had so much pain associated with what should be fun going somewhere and, you know, talking about what it is you're interested in and, and getting, and they were so worried about leaving for that time because of all the catch up that they had mm -hmm. that was occupying their brain. So we swooped in and, and supported them and you can already start seeing the changes that are occurring. We didn't realize what impact we had. When I first started Bottleneck, I wanted to make a lot of money. That's why I started Bottleneck. That was the sole reason. And I'm sorry, to, but that's what I wanted to do. I was homeless, no money. I wanted to be, you know, earning a lot of money. So I never had to worry about that again. And we got a call one Saturday morning from a client uh, and I normally wouldn't answer calls because I don't like doing that. But this particular one, I just answered. And I told him, what the heck are you doing calling me? And I've shared this story before quite a bit, but this is where everything changed for me. He called me to tell me, and he had been fairly successful um, uh, in his marketing business. And he said, hey, I just want to let you know, uh, this is the first Saturday I've taken off because he hired somebody 90 days prior from us. This is the first time I've taken off on a Saturday and I can't remember how long. And he says, it's directly because of working with you. You've taken away all of those administrative tasks and I'm not stressed. Then the phone rustles away and his wife said, Jamie, thank you for giving me my husband back. Whew. Mm. Like, are you kidding me? Mm. That was the day that everything shifted for us. And, and, I had no idea that we could provide a service for somebody that we want to live well, you know, there's bills, you got to earn money, right? But we had no idea that we could have this type of impact. And then that's where our ripple effect was founded. Mm -hmm. We asked- well, I want you to talk about your ripple effect. So this is a great segue into oh. that. Yeah, sorry. I, I get to talk and I'm telling you, you got to shut no, me up. This is great. No, it all flows together. <laughs> well, well it, 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 it let us know that we could affect somebody in such a positive way that they could go and affect other lives, infect and effect in such a positive way. So what, what did they do? They, they were going out to dinner and a movie. That doesn't seem very big. On the other hand, it seems huge. The impact it had with that family unit to be able to spend time like that, mom, dad, son, to where they weren't able to do that on previous weekends is amazing in and of itself. Imagine the conversations, the memories that'll be created. And I know this may sound cheesy from the onset, but just think about that for a second. As a kid, do you remember doing special? I remember getting straight A's in school and my dad taking me to the little market basket in North Pole, Alaska and said, Jamie, pick out any toy. And I picked out this little, this little toy airplane because I loved airplanes. I still remember that to this day. But had he not ever done that, I would have never had that memory. Mm -hmm. So you're creating those family unit memories together. And not only that, you're going out sharing that hard-earned money that you've earned with another business owner who has employees, who has hopefully a good culture going on there, but they're trying to build a business, earn an income for them. And then guess what? Then you're going to another business and affecting them the same way of giving them money so that they can earn for their family, for their employees. And then it's, it's just, it's a ripple effect. 
And that's why we always say, create your own ripple, create a positive ripple effect. I think it's just absolutely amazing uh, to be able to be in a position to either continue this ripple effect or create a new ripple effect. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. Well, there's nothing cheesy at all about what you just said. To me, it's all <laughs> tied in to our purposes as human beings, you know, and what drives us to give our best in any given day and knowing that we can have a positive impact on someone else's life is a huge motivator. So I just love what you do. And I, I have a final thing I want to ask you about, because I found this fascinating when you and I were talking before that there are certain words that you don't use that we hear all the time. Mm -hmm. And I would, I am curious to have you share what is it uh, about these words that causes you to not want to use them? And what words do you use instead? And those three words that I remember making note of were help, problem, and solution. So talk about those, why you don't use them and what you use instead. It's too easy. It's, it's it, in my opinion, those are all three negative words, negative words. Um, and solution, what does that even mean? <laughs> um, problem, negative, problem. There's a problem. You automatically think negative thoughts and help. Meredith, you don't need help. You may need support. You may need guidance. You don't have a problem. You're experiencing a challenge. You can always overcome challenges. Problems sometimes are unsolvable. Challenges, ooh, that's motivating. I'm up for a challenge. I'm not up for a problem. And then if you look at a solution, what the heck does that mean? Like a solution, why not a service? Instead of think of a solution for this, no. Think of a th service that you can find to provide you the answers to overcome the challenges that you need guidance or support for. That sounds so much more positive and people can relate to that in so much more and apply so much more energy and be so much more intentional than it is to get help. There's helplines. Ugh. You know, there's solutions for everything. What, is, what does that mean? And then, of course, if you look at problems, uh, everybody has problems. But there's only the chosen few that have challenges that overcome these challenges, that talk about oh, obstacle courses. Look how, much, look how much people go on retreats and they do obstacle courses. Why? Because there's challenges that they get to overcome. There's no problems. There's challenges. So those, that's my long, longer story on, on those three words. And I think it's really impactful. And, and we do that internally here at Bottleneck. That's so cool. W one of the things that I was thinking of, the, you were talking about what those words mean to me, it conjured up victim, you know, and, mm. and you're looking to have people be owners, owners in the way you help them make decisions, owners in the way you hire them and, and encourage them to, you know, map out the roles and responsibilities that give them the greatest fulfillment. So I just love how you bring the alternate words to life in your company. Jamie, we could talk for a long time, I know. Given our time constraint, I am gonna need to bring our uh, conversation to a close. I want you to share how people can connect with you, learn more about bottleneck distant assistance so that if they are finding themselves to be a bottleneck and would love to get support from you, uh, I would uh, love for them to know how to do that. Yeah. And thank you again, Meredith, uh, for letting me uh, chime on today. <laughs> uh, the best way to do it is just go to bottleneck.online. Uh, bottleneck.online is the easiest way to, to learn about setting up a consultation. Consultation is really nice. Yeah, we have several uh, team members here that can answer your questions and dive into that more. Uh, of course, we're, our, we're on social media. And if you're interested more on a little bit of, of my story and how we've how I've managed to share processes, systems, workflows, hiring, uh, that's my book. It's Quit Repeating Yourself. And uh, you can learn more by going to quitrepeatingyourself.com. Oh, that's great. Jamie, thank you for who you are 
who you were with me today and who I know you are every day in the world with your team. You really are having a magnificent ripple effect. And I thank you for that. Thank you. (laughs) Thanks for tuning into my podcast. Now head over to growstrongleaders.com and check out our two books, Connect With Your Team and Peer Coaching Made Simple. While you're there, download the free facilitator guide to find out how to implement our unique peer coaching system. Until next time, I'm Meredith Bell.